And joining us now on the debate, Claire Hopkinson. She's executive director of the Toronto Arts Council. Anthony Cimolino, general director of the Stratford Shakespeare Festival. Gerd Hauck, dean of the Faculty of Communication and Design at Ryerson University. Pandora Top, singer and arts mentor from Sudbury, Ontario. And of course, we welcome back Jeff Melanson from the National Ballet School. Okay, good to have everybody around the table. Um, okay, first questions to Pandora. Is that your name really, Pandora Top? That is your real name? Yes, it is my real name. That's not a showbiz name. Um, no. You show me a birth certificate and that name is on it, because that's just too fantastic a name. <laughs> well, you can thank my mother. I will thank your mother next time I see her. Okay. <laughs> Claire, let's get to, I want to follow up on something that right. uh, we talked to uh, Jeff and I about just a few moments ago, and that is that all levels of government these days are really struggling with debts and deficits. And I want to know how well you think the arts community is making its claim on the public purse, given all of that. Well, we have a great story to tell, that's what I can say. Uh, we've got a great story to tell about the arts to a politician of any stripe, whether it's someone who's interested in, uh, in neighborhood improvement or vi revitalization, the soul of the city, whether it is someone who is interested in economic development, the arts tells a great story. That's the story they want to hear, I suspect. That is. Of course, it's not the whole story, but it is an important part of the story, particularly uh, as the country is coming out of a recession. Um, as Jeff mentioned before, uh, for every dollar that the Toronto Arts Council invests in a Toronto Arts Council funded organization, we probably support perhaps 7% maximum of their organization, for every dollar there is another $14 returned. We're not talking about indirect impact, we're talking about other levels of investment, private sector, and earned income. So we should just double, triple, quadruple your budget and then we'd all be on easy street. Is that the idea? Well, it really has a very big impact on this city, on the livability of this city, um, on the ability to track the kind of businesses and the kind of business executives who want to, who want to move here to, uh, to be innovative, to be, have a creative city. So we think we've got an excellent story to tell and we know that every single dollar that is invested in the arts has a fantastic return, not just monetarily, but it is the soul of the city. Also food for the soul, for sure. Anthony, there is an assumption the Stratford Shakespeare Festival is so big and so famous and so highly regarded that it is kind of, you know, above or beyond the political winds of the day. Is that true? Well, we receive about 4%, the equivalent of 4% of our total budget, which is $60 million. We get 4% of that from the two levels of uh, government in terms of arts councils. And we return about $70 million in taxes to Canada's governments. And remember that 30% of that, over 30% of that, comes from outside of our country each year. So that's newfound money coming into Canada, building Canadian hospitals, running Canadian universities, paving Canadian roads. So the government gets far more back from Stratford than they put in. And, and you know, I think, I think politicians realize that. I was fortunate enough to get about a half hour visit with Jim Flaherty in Ottawa last week. And, and you know, I, I think politicians understand that the arts are a good thing. What we have to do is make the case with Canadians and politicians as to why that tripling of the Arts Council budget that you talked about is in fact a great economic driver. I mean, it certainly is at Stratford. For every ticket we sell, there's $288 spent on the local economy. Hmm. For every single ticket. That's a good multiplier effect. It's huge. How about in Sudbury? How does it work up there, Pandora? Well, I think uh, we have uh, a much fewer uh, organizations that are um, on the ground in Sudbury, um, proportional with the population, but uh, we also have, because of that, I think, less access and so more entrepreneurial, uh, sort of an effect when it comes to the artists that are in the community. And um, mm -hmm. I want to get away from the financial argument for a second, Gerd, and go to you on this one. We've talked about fiscal deficits, but one of the other deficits in our society today is the one you deal with with students, attention deficit. Okay. There's a lot of attention <laughs> deficit going around today. And I wonder what effect you think that has on the life of the arts in our city and province. Actually, I have two responses to that. I believe, on the one hand, that you are correct to assume that there is an attention deficit amongst the younger population that has been observed since the 70s when you know, researchers like Raymond Williams noted um, what he calls visual and concentrational rhythms that are being reduced to the time between commercial breaks. And I think we see a lot of that to this day. On the other hand, uh, I have observed that students, young students, 
who play certain video games have no trouble attending to those video games for long, long periods of time, mm -hmm. much longer periods for, uh, of time than we give them, give them, in fact, credit for. They can play it for hours. They can play they? it for hours, yeah. and they have no trouble doing that, yes. Um, but the, um, the concern that I have is that our students increasingly uh, are impacted by a faster moving world in, in which uh, quick attention is demanded for an ever increasing flood of information. And we know from medical evidence that attention deficit disorder is very much on the rise. So it's a huge concern for us. And part of the issue that, that we deal with in our research when we do w uh, work in the area of the way in which the digital media have impacted on the arts has to do with the ethics of this. Hmm. You know, do we have an ethical obligation, or even a moral obligation, to our students to make sure that they're not, uh, that they don't suffer in the long-term long effects from this? Anthony, I have no doubt but that they can play these video games for eight hours at a time, but can they sit through a two and a half hour performance at, at uh, Stratford? Sure they can, they okay. love it. You know, as a director, I realize that the first 10 minutes of any play is about, you know, for the audience, to some degree, it's about who gets the armrest, right? <laughs> There's a decompression that has to happen where people begin to enter the world of the play and then they become transported and so there's a different sense of time there's a, a narrative line there but there's also images and themes that transport them and we find young people are really it's one of the things that gives me such hope is how they respond to Shakespeare and love it even today yeah, even today. Can I just I know, interject here if I may? Yeah, please. Um, I was involved in the production of, uh, of Henry V a few years ago, and uh, this was a production done at the University of Toronto here, and many students were brought in from the high schools to see that play. They had read the play at the schools, uh, they had been advised, you know, what type of play it is. It's one of the, you know, one of the political plays by Shakespeare. And they had limited expectations of how much entertainment value there was in this production. This was a highly imaginative pr uh, production by a colleague of mine uh, who used the setting of a high school where two tennis teams in the high school had gotten into an altercation and threw books at each other, <laughs> and an, a setting that the students could identify with. And then it was actually done by only women. And the chorus in this particular production was the teacher who introduced the students to the play. They started reading the play. They started assuming the roles in that play mm. and fought out the battles of Henry V. The high school students were thrilled to sit through this play for two and a half hours. And the common comment we had at the time, we didn't know that Shakespeare could be so much fun. Huh. Shakespeare truly had become, as Jan Cott would have put it, our contemporary in that mm. particular instance. But there are many productions of Shakespeare which sadly don't have the same effect of students. So here's where I'm not I take blaming Stratford for that. Okay. Here's where I take the conversation from the lofty heights that you've taken it, speaking to the soul of our young people, and bring it right back down to the gutter of dollars and cents. And Jeff, I go to you on that. We talked we talked in the introduction of the program about some of these numbers, how from 1971 to 2001, the number of artists in Canada apparently went up 300%. The regular labor force, the rest of the labor force, let me put it that way, went up 80%. So arts participation by those who want to make a living at it, hugely you know, above the rest of the, um, the employment sector. Question is, has the demand for what they do kept up to the demand, of, uh, kept up to the number of the people who want to get into it? Well, it's an interesting question you raise because there is this supply-demand debate raging around the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think the question of too much supply is just a false one. You know, we would never ask because there's too much air, there are too many trees, there are too many lakes. Could there be too much art? Of course there can't be. The question really is how do we build sustainable careers for these folk? And I think what you're going to see, actually, if you look at those stats, a lot of those people are working in digital media contexts. They are working in architecture firms. There are a number of different professional channels that aren't just uh, in the live performing arts. And that, that the performing arts, of course, are important. But there are tons and tons of opportunities for these creative people working at research in motion, developing applications. There's a pile of new types of jobs that require these kind of creative yeah. skills. Let me put this to Pandora. How do you make a living? Tell me uh, what you actually do. I'm quite diversified in my sources of revenue. I've um, worked as a professional artist for 20 years. Professional artist meaning what? Uh, in the theater and the music industry. So you sing? Mm -hmm. What else? And I act. You act? Mm -hmm. You mentor? Yes, as an artist educator with the conservatory. So yeah. you're involved in education as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would it be easier for you to make a living at what you do if there were half as many of you out there trying to do it? No, not at all. Because I think that um, what you do as an artist is uh, create something. And if you're an artist, you are never <laughs> fulfilled with each creation. You have to always be moving on and always evolving. 
And uh, when you're a good artist, you resonate with the community and uh, it creates this multiplying effect uh, in yourself and in the community. And um, that ends up, there's, you build your own audience at the same time, create a thirst and a desire for more of that, whether that's in uh, you know, the mentorship with younger students or with awareness that you create with a new theater goer or a new production that appeals to them. Does that make sense to you, Claire? Well, I was going to say, though I'm not a huge fan of just putting out stats, that at this period that we're talking about, that uh, the number of artists in Toronto over a 10-year period increased by 42%. But actually, consumer spending in uh, arts and culture increased by 49%. So, so it kept pace. Well, and, and a little bit more. And a little bit more. I think when we're creating brilliant content, when there's really innovative, risk-taking, creative content down there, it creates the market. Right. I'm not talking that it's simple. It's very difficult for artists to make a living. I understand that. But we are increasing the market. And creativity spurs on creativity. I mean, yes. to Jeff's point mm -hmm. about digital media and creation. I mean, David Johnston, who's now our Governor General, about five, six years ago came and said to me, look, we would like to start a digital media um, campus for the University of Waterloo uh, when he was then president in Stratford and because of the creativity that's present in the community the musicians the novelists the writers the you know the uh, uh, the actors and and people who do all sorts of work one helps the other so Jeff's point about there can't be too much I know to some degree people will say well we're gonna public art everywhere but it spurs on creativity uh, that also creates new phone I, systems, new I digital. You know. No doubt but that all of that is true, but then you look at the other statistics and it says that the average salary for all of these people who want to make a living in the arts is about 27 grand a year. That's not going to buy you too, you know, it's not going to keep you in shoes in Toronto, right? Well, you know, uh, I'm finding that more and more of our young people are now taking on careers that, uh, uh, you know, they, they're entering into the arts I'm finding a lot of my friends' children are also now becoming chefs and entering the service economy in all sorts of different ways because they want quality of life. So that's our, uh, I see, that's our, it's not just about money. Girl. I think one of the, one of the strange paradoxes of the development of the arts in my experience is that um, you tend to have creatively hugely productive periods in times of retraction, in times of few resources. Let me remind you, for example, as one example, the mid-1950s mid, mid in England were a time of significant financial hardship in England. The cultural productivity was very ossified at the time. It was very much an established theatre. And that was the time when the Osborns and the Arnold Weskers and the, and the Harold Pinters of this world emerged and created a, a whole new wave. It was called the first wave of the new English theatre. And you have similar developments in other countries where, you know, restraint causes creativity. And I hate to say this, but the greatest creativity in Toronto happens in the fringes. Mm -hmm. In the fringes where people don't keep paid a lot of money, they can't make a living doing this. They have to have three, four, five different jobs to sustain themselves. And you compare that to countries like Germany, for example, which we discussed in the green room, which throws money at the arts, where I find sometimes the creativity lags behind a little mm -hmm. bit because systemically it's so ossified or so sluggish I sometimes use the, the German metaphor of it's a, a maggot inside a fat piece of ham. <laughs> it's too healthy, you know? Is and of course, there's a, there's a balance in between yeah. those two yes. where, yeah. where you strike a healthy balance where creativity is supported in a manner in which it should be supported. Well, at the end of the day, it often gets down to a question of what is art? And I know everybody's asked that question a thousand times around this table. But, you know, part of the reason we need to know that is that if you're going to get public funding, the public wants to have a sense that its money is going to something that actually is art. And I want to play, just look at the monitors here in the studio. There's a guy named Hennessy Youngman who's got a series of videos called Art Thoughts. It's on YouTube if you want to look it up. We'll play a bit of that and then come back and chat. Michael, roll tape, please. I've been getting a lot of emails from many of you that basically saying, you know, Hennessy, um, I have no artistic talent whatsoever, yet I'm compelled to want to make art. And first off, Internet, I want to express my displeasure with your use of such antiquated terms like like talent and making. You know, I mean, Internet, who you think you is? Internet, you know, Brancusi. Art's not about making a sculpture out of scratch. I mean, you know, in, in this kind of work, you don't really want to call it an artwork. You want to call it a proposition. You know what I'm saying? Um, you mean, it's, it's like the, it could be, it has the possibility of being art. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like a, this is a question about art, you know, a query, you know what I'm saying? And you know, there's no such thing as bad questions. You know what I'm saying? Just bad answers. 
I don't know about that. I've asked a number of bad questions on this program. Had a lot of good answers. But the notion of art without talent, Jeff, is one of the things I guess he's getting at here. Uh, are there too many untalented people out there trying to make a living through art? No, no, no. Oh, come on. None? No, art, I, I think the point you're, 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 you're kind of making, in terms of government funding, in Canada we've had the sort of nation-building period of arts investment, we've had city building, and we've had the sort of economic development and tourism, all of which is true. But I don't think as a country we've really had a conversation about art and culture and what it means to Canadians, and I think that's the conversation that we need to have today. That's why Culture Days, with which Anthony is quite intimately involved in, is so important. Um, I think the connection that maybe Mr. Youngman is trying to make is the internet allows people to create and consume art in a very democratized way, in a very accessible way, which is fantastic. That's not to say they're going to be professional artists. And I think what we're trying to define right now is what's the difference between wanting everybody to create art or to feel that they themselves are artists, and how does that interrelate with the profession? And I think that's the sort of challenge for us. I think it's easy to define that in the commercial arts, but in the not-for-profit sector, you know, what's the difference between your amateur and your professional? And I think, in a way, we've kind of siloized some of those areas in the arts, and community arts education, arts education in the public schools as separate things, for example, and we're starting to see that come together now in a way that's healthy. Well, let me follow up with Claire on this. Your, your budget's what? You give out a lot of money, About right? $10 million. $10 million bucks that you give out to? Oh, 450 organizations and another 250 artists per year. Okay, and the more, the more we have difficulty defining what art is, presumably that means more groups are coming before you you know, where, where making the case of that this is art is a tougher case to make. Don't you find that? It's a rich discussion. Um, it's always... It's a rich discussion is a nice way of saying... It, it is a rich discussion because we do. We have artists sitting around the adjudication tables, you know, every, every week discussing these questions. I would say it's a passion of mine to want to unleash their creativity in every single Torontonian, to have them all sing, all dance, all participate, as an arm, as a arm's length uh, agency which delivers funding from the City of Toronto, our investment strategy is to invest in professional artists. But also, we're also investing in professional artists who are working out there in the community to unleash the creative potential of others and to work with youth and bring seniors out of isolation and, and to get involved in social programs that enhance uh, social cohesion. But these are artists who bring a particular art form to to bear in that in that work. Anthony, you look art. like you want it. Well, art forms evolve; they change. Yeah. Shakespeare's place. I mean, Shakespeare would have never thought of himself as an artist. He did publish some poetry, and that I think he felt he was doing something that was artistic. His plays, however, he would have said, "Look, I, I'm a working guy. I'm part of a company putting on entertainment." Mm -hmm. Now, the entertainment was brilliant. It, it, it moved forward poetry and writing, and we were very lucky he was published at all. His friends published him. He, in his lifetime, never showed any interest in having his work particularly published, apart from the quartos that were taken. So the art can change over time. Getting more people involved in that, I think, can be extremely positive. And I think it's a great question. I watch my children in front of the computer screens and what they're doing and, and commenting and mashing and changing things. It's, it brings out the artist in them. But as part of what you're saying, if Shakespeare didn't know he was an artist, art is really hard to define? I guess what I'm trying to say is that at day's end, we shouldn't worry about judgment and categorization and all those other things. We should just worry about creativity and expressing ourselves. Okay, but we do have to do that, and I'm going to go to you on this, because you've been on Ontario Arts Council juries, right? Mm -hmm. Where you actually have to decide, mm -hmm. this art is worth supporting, this is crap. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I How think, do you do uh, that? You say that? Uh, <laughs> I think I just did. <laughs> Only in closed doors. Yeah. I think closer. you say it on juries, don't you? No. I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, after working with artists across uh, the province in the artist educator course, as well as on juries, what you end up having to do is make a differentiation between the evolution of what art is and how it gets there. I think there's creativity is innate, uh, which is an an aspect that we all have in us, an ingenuity, a, cap a capacity for innovation, a uh, capacity which starts with an improvisation, which starts with taking opportunities like uh, experiences to, to see how that works and gets outside of our, our comfort zone. And then we move towards uh, an exercise or a discipline of, of choosing to practice it making that conscious okay, choice, and, and then we get right. to You're art. speaking to the soul. I'm talking yeah. dollars and cents here. Mm -hmm. You had to make a decision as a member of a jury I'm going to fund this, mm -hmm. I'm not going to fund this. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, you had to make a decision about mm -hmm. this is worthy and this isn't. Mm -hmm. 
We do that as consumers every day mm -hmm. of art, don't mm -hmm. we? Yes, we do. We do. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's all fair ball in this game, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and it comes down to, I think, in the end, there are so many different people on the planet that resonates with different, different art diff resonates with different mm -hmm. consumers. And I think that... But there should be no final arbiter here. It's not just the public or the academy or the government. They all have their role to play. They all each yeah. come to the table with support. I mean, you know, the Impressionists were loathed by the academy in the 1870s in, in France. So we shouldn't allow any one body to say what art is. It changes. We should all be involved in it. Who decides? You should decide. I like your taste. <laughs> I give Listen, you the final. Um, Culture Days. Uh, that is a three-day celebration where we invite Canadians in to meet artists, to better understand why they do what they do and how they do what they do. And they've turned out in the first iteration of this, this past fall, in the hundreds of thousands. And so it, it provides an opportunity for, I was going to say consumers, let's just say you Canadians, hate that word, right? people, yeah. really sure, yeah. because there's more to it, yeah. much more to it than consumerism, right? Yeah. So it, it helps people understand and try out new things. And that, I think, is really critical to the future for the arts. Jeff, let's talk multiculturalism for a second. How do you see the encounter between Western and non-Western traditions in art, uh, especially in a place like Ontario's capital city, where you have such a melange of everything? Well, I think that's the, the key question for the city, actually. When we talk about what makes us culturally unique, it is that diversity. I think the really hard part is there's no place on earth that we can look at that's seen the kind of radical change in such a short window of time. So in a way, I don't think we've done it as well as we could have. We've managed the transition on a number of levels. And this is not just arts. This is education and evolution and so on. So I think the key thing for us in terms of arts interface is trying to figure out you know, how do we engage some of these communities. Um, I know that the arts councils are making huge strides in this regard, but I think also as consumers trying to figure out, I will use the consumer word, um, how do we support each other? Because actually what's, what's remarkable about Toronto, when I was with the Royal Conservatory of Music, we launched a World Music Centre reaching into, into different communities. And I was shocked that what I did not know was happening in the city. Like incredibly talented, Zakir Hussein doing a recital somewhere in somebody's living room and we don't know about that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Like we need to sort of create the framework that allow more and more people to participate in that. And, uh, and that's critical. And I think there's a natural inclination when people come to the country to want to culturally stick with what's familiar, which makes it hard for those of us uh, that, that maybe aren't part of their particular ethnic um, group to participate as fully as we need to. Mm -hmm. And really the future of the city is going to be building connections across mm -hmm. those divides. Okay, let's again, you're going to forgive me here. I'm sorry. I'm a little focused on the dollars and cents tonight. But 2008, the last year for which we have numbers available, ticket sales accounted for one half of the operating revenues for the performing arts organizations, roughly speaking, right? Public sector grants was a quarter. Private sector contributions, the remaining quarter. What I want to find out is whether you folks think those proportions are the way they ought to be. Go ahead, Anthony, first. Well, you're asking someone who lives in a situation where 80% of our revenue comes from the box office. Not and, 50. Uh, you're, not 50. You're well so, above that. So, um, and I'm thrilled with what the festival has been able to do in terms of attracting audiences over the years and supporting artists. I think the question um, really comes down to how much government support allows for sustainability, allows for training, enables uh, the ticket prices to be lower, allows artists to take risks. And that should be the proper amount. Mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, we're, it can be 80%. I think that 80 number's- 80% state funding. Yeah, state it's funding. way too high. I once had the French artistic director say to me, you know, there are some days where I don't know where we're gonna find the other 20%. <laughs> and I want to slap them. <laughs> um, you know, so that's too much, because it means that you don't really need a public, hmm. right? But on the other continuum, 4% is, is it's, it's, it's threatening the ongoing sustainability of an entity which is very important to this country. So Just I think somewhere in the middle. Just in case people missed your earlier comment, 4% of your budget is from the taxpayer. And, and we are by far the largest arts institution in Canada. We're twice the size of the next size performing arts institution. So 4% from government, 96% is from the box office, or private donations. donors. That's yeah. right. Huh. Okay, the, the, the problem about uh, having significant private donor uh, support is that you could be beholden to the particular agenda or the issues that this donor wants to see uh, you know, uh, uh, represented in a particular company. One of the strongest arguments one can make for the significant state sponsorship that you find in Europe, 80%, 90% even in some cases, is that you, as a, you know, it safeguards the public uh, or provides the, 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 the freedom 
to uh, to make creative choices. Why to would take it do risks. that? It just makes you beholden to government. To well, the actually, sector. the funny thing is, you'd find that if you look at the German example, for example, uh, as an instance, the very significant amounts of money that are spent on on state and and, and uh, provincial theatres is actually used by theatre artists to criticise the government. Hmm. A lot of that work, ironically, <laughs> is critical is of mind. government. Yeah. So the government actually quite willingly, or the governments, because it's not the federal government, it's the state governments that provide the funds in the cities, it, it willingly supports artists in order to engage in a dialogue mm. about its own viability. And doesn't give the Minister of Culture too much power? Probably does. Hmm. I'd like Claire? to add to that, because for, for 20 years or so I worked in the field of opera, the field of new opera, and my particular mission was to give Canadian composers and Canadian writers a voice in that uh, art form, because it's such a powerful art form. Um, and I did a lot of work with the states because I was on the board of uh, the Opera America and I really noticed the difference between our funding system here and the funding system in the states which was much more about the donor. Um, so there was a, a much higher percentage of risk taking, of new work being developed, of giving that opportunity to the Canadian artists, of telling our Canadian stories here in Canada even though it's an expensive art form than there was in the states because the donors wanted to see stories and hear songs that they'd heard before. They wanted to go for different reasons, whereas the creators wanted to explore our own stories. So uh, having had that example in front of me, I can say that there, the, the balance is critical. How much we invest in our culture, in our identity. Okay, Jeff, in which case, if you want to have the best possible art scene out there, have we got the right formula here, where it's roughly half from the box office, a quarter private sector, a quarter public sector? Uh, personally, I, I like looking at growth rather than a one-time accounting snapshot of proportions in terms of where things are going. Growth and, of what? Well, if you look at these categories, this is a snapshot of one point of time. Okay. Which is an accounting measure. So, sorry, I'm not, I, won't get, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but basically, what you find in the arts community is a surplus of good ideas, great ideas. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, how do you fund them? And the organizations and artists that are successful are resourceful. And they're resourceful in all three of those areas, government funding, earned revenue, and private sector support. And I think further to some of the discussion, what's actually good about this mix is the government has its own process in terms of deciding what to fund. The market, through ticket sales, decides, and private sector donors decide. So it's actually quite balanced in mm -hmm. terms of the investment strategy. But I think ultimately the, the key thing for artists is equipping them to understand that and then saying, look, if you're going to make it as an artist successfully, you're going to have to be really resourceful in terms of figuring out not only how do you create phenomenal art, which they're already doing, but also how do you fund it. Just follow up. Put some flesh on that bone. Give me, give me sort of a neat idea that emanates from, from an artist or from the private sector that uh, is a new way to fund great art. Uh, well, I think there's a number of examples, and, and I'm sure everyone, uh, Anthony will have some, but, uh, you know, Soul Pepper might be an example of a, of a theater company in Toronto that's grown pretty dramatically. There have been some supporters who have put in um, artistic director discretionary funds that could be invested on different projects over a specific amount of time, um, really giving the artistic director a lot of discretion in terms of how they might be utilized. The nonprofit finance mm -hmm. fund in the U.S. has looked at a lot of these models as well in terms of how do you how do you equip artists and arts organizations to capitalize. But is this finding a champion? You, fi you find a very rich guy who wants his name on the theater, and that's that's how you fund well, it. Well, you know, I, I hate to put it quite this way. It's not all that, but if you look at the history of art, patronage is a is a significant player. And whether it's church or church or state or private individuals, mm -hmm. those players are always there. This is not a new concept. What kind of you can't you can't rename the festival theater, you know, the Petro Canada. Or the, no. you know, yeah, I mean, they're not going to go for that. No. So how do you do your kind of intriguing patronage We're ideas? We're very fortunate. We have, uh, first of all, we have 20,000 people who make donations to the festival. And most of them are, are school teachers and people who just care about the art. And they're not mm -hmm. giving us a, a ton of money each, but they're giving us a very important gift from them. So I think the more you can build a good solid root system in the community, yes. the more people care about you. That's what matters. That, that's what matters. I think too for some institutions in this country the endowments matter. You know, um, th they can provide ongoing support for uh, usually companies of size. It's not an answer for every company but it is a, an important part of the equation now. I like that line, you've got to find people who care about you. And I want to follow up on that. Claire, to you first. Well, Again, well, here, here comes a question. Roughly, uh, according to the stats I have here, roughly a third of Canadian households spent some money on live performance arts, performing arts, which meant that two-thirds didn't. Right. And I want to know whether you think, in order to find those people Anthony talks about, the people who really care, 
Should the approach be, we got to get more money out of that one third that goes, or should the approach be, how do we get that two thirds to get off their couch and come out and see us for the first time ever, maybe? Where do you put your eggs? Mm. Do you only have one egg? No. Okay. <laughs> well, just to throw another statistic on this, 64% um, of all Ontarians believe that cultural work in their community is very important. But are they prepared to support it? They, they are prepared to see their government support it, for sure. 80% of Ontarians are prepared to see taxpayer money go into the arts. So that's a very positive. Mm. However, it doesn't say anything. It doesn't say how we, much they think no, it should be supported. No, it doesn't say how much. However, it does show an, uh, uh, um, an understanding of the value of the arts. That's sure. really what I can, wanted to get to. What I would like to talk more about is about the necessity to create relationships for each artist, for each organization, for the arts sector as a whole to create relationships with, I'm not going to say the consumer, with with its neighbors, with, with, with the people who are living right. in the neighborhood, with, um, with the business community. Okay. It okay. is very much about creating a relationship and creating a dynamic relationship. I get all that. I want to let me try this with Pandora. When you try to do something in Sudbury, for example, do you think to yourself, the audience I've got to hit is the audience that's never come out of their homes before to see something? Or are you going after the people who, that one third, who are you know, always out of their homes maybe once every couple of weeks because they love the theater and they want to go see something? Oh, you have to go after both. All uh, the... Can you go after both? Mm -hmm. You have to be quite resourceful and you have to put the work in, uh, personally make those contacts and build awareness. And, uh... But you've got finite time and finite budget. Mm -hmm. Can you really go after both? Uh, I think you have to. Hmm. You have to. Gert, what do you think? There are ways of doing that. Um, I would go, uh, uh, in some ways, I would look at it differently. I would look at it in the generational terms. The people who support the arts, the 35% of things that you quoted, those are people who have supported the arts because you know their parents supported the arts and they've grown up, they're now middle age or even gray haired like I am. Uh, when you go to you know, the established theaters, that's what you see, people with gray hair. You don't see a lot of young people. And why do we see a lot of young people? Because for them, that art form is not as accessible as it once was to the generation of, 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 of their parents. Maybe their parents didn't take them. Maybe their parents didn't take them. But these people also have a desire for creating art. We saw that from the mm -hmm. video clip. Yeah. They have the capacity to create art, but they do it in a different medium. They tend to do it on YouTube, or they tend to do it with their video camera, or they tend to do it in the digital world. They are natives of the different world from the one that I grew up in. That's I'm an immigrant to the digital world. They are natives. And I think this is an opportunity for us, a growth opportunity. Yes. You want growth. Where we have a huge potential to bring in young people to increase the uh, the the, the well, budget. It's all well and good for them, but does it put bum in, bums in the seats? If you do it well, if you do it and intelligently, time. absolutely. And it's when you say in that direction. young, yes, and when you say yeah. young, especially in the province of Ontario, you say diverse. You absolutely. say people yeah. who come from all sorts of absolutely. different cultures that perhaps hadn't been haven't been coming to Stratford and now are starting mm -hmm. to. So mm -hmm. that demands from arts organizations that we look at our programming, that we look at who uh, who is there, what artists, mm -hmm. what writers, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. we open the doors. And and right. because I think one of the most exciting <coughs> in terms of this province is the change in, in, yeah. in ethnic groups and demographics. I, that's going to lead to standing creativity. The numbers you quoted are actually quite good for Canada, but if you look at the dystopia, which is south of the border, there's evidence that suggests that the average 17-year-old watches about, I think, 12,000 hours of television. And we now know that they spend even more time than that in front of their computer studying that. Mm -hmm. And the average 17-year-old in the U.S. spends, a bit, I think it was 12 hours l watching live art. Theater, 12 hours ballet, by the time 12 they hours are a year. Oh, 12 hours a year. 12 hours a year. Yikes. So compared to the 12,000 hours and the more than 12,000 hours no watching other media. Well, I so don't know. We can those say 12 we can, hours go a long we can, way. <laughs> we can well, throw our arms up and say, was, hopefully this Claire, go ahead. I was at the Roy Thompson Hall last week, and it was a uh, program of um, new music, John Adams, um, Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And uh, I walked to that hall, and it felt like I was in a house that loved music and most of those people were young people and I have to say the audience was there I think the young people were there there were sound check tickets for fourteen dollars so this is another reason why we need to invest in our arts because to have that fourteen dollar ticket you either need a very generous donor or you need some government funding and the, 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 the more accessible as we say the price of ticket the more we know people will come. The fact that there are free well, museum passes allow... I, let allow me follow up on that. Yes. That's exactly where I wanted to go. we got yeah. two minutes to go here. 
Uh, I had a meeting last week with some Citizenship Canada people who wanted to tell me about the fact that you've got this, when you become a new Canadian now, they give you this passport. Mm -hmm. And you've got a year of free access to how many different participating organizations? Tons. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can you go yes, to, Stra you yes, can go to you Stratford can. Yeah, for yeah. free? You can go to the festival and see something, if not There's free, cheap. There's a deep discount. Deep That's discount. Right. Yeah. Do people do this, Anthony? Yes, they do. New Canadians yes, do, do take advantage of this. Yes, they do. And, 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 but, but it has to be a comprehensive change. This, yeah. this is not about just marketing. This is about opening up the institutions to say, we are different because Canada is different. And we're going to, you know, so that's very important. It has to be of a piece. Jeff, does that work? You get them in the, I mean, the theory is obviously get them in the door once and you'll have them for life. Does that actually I, work? I think it does work. And I think we have to explore how the new channels help to create opportunities further to your, your where are the other two thirds of the people. We know 97% of kids play video games, interactive games. We know the two of the top five most popular, Guitar Hero and Dance Dance Revolution. They're trying to engage. And the question is, how do we get them from that into the live experience? And you've done that at the ballet, haven't you? You've got a connection with So You Think You Can Dance. We're working on it. You're working on it. Keep working on it. Okay, she's giving me the hook. we got to go. I think, what do they call that in the theater? The hook. The hook, that's right. Okay, so I was right on that. Uh, from left to right, around the table, Garrett Houck from the Faculty of Communication and Design at Ryerson University, Claire Hopkinson from the Toronto Arts Council, Jeff Melanson from the National Ballet School of Canada, the Special Advisor to Toronto Mayor Rob Ford. Get him out to a play, Jeff. Good luck on that. Uh, Anthony Cimolino. Stratford Shakespeare Festival, God, it's good. And Pandora Top, singer, arts mentor from Sudbury, Ontario. Great having this conversation about arts and culture on our program tonight. Thanks, everybody.